anybody walked in in the last two seconds. I'm Megan Baker. I work on a cloud engineering team at Workday uh, on an OpenStack-based project. Um, and if you need to contact me later at any point, there's that information. Um, so the problem that I've been thinking uh, a lot about uh, over the past few months, um, troubleshooting distributed architectures, why is it so much more difficult than um, a traditional or, or like monolithic app? Um, uh, so it used to be that if your whole uh, project, your whole software project would one would run on one machine, uh, there'd be one log directory where you could find almost any logs that were uh, created in the process of running your software. Uh, there, there weren't too many places to look for um, things to go wrong, basically. Uh, so you could keep tabs on things and troubleshoot from one place, and a little bit of grepping would get you pretty far. But then. Things started to grow and grow. Uh, and it became evident that scaling up only gets you so far. And uh, so that's one reason why the rise of microservices and, and distributed architecture, uh, that's one reason for that. But with that comes a problem. Um, microservices, uh, and you end up creating uh, it, the, the end result is more complicated. Uh, there are a lot of benefits. You know, you have a lot of flexibility in uh, composing your project. You can swap out components for one that suits your need a lot easier than if you have to rewrite an entire library uh, in your old project to do that. Uh, you can scale up and down more easily. Um, and if one of your servers totally craps out, you can design your architecture in such a way that it's less likely to disrupt your customers. Um, but scaling distributed systems also makes it more complicated. Um, you're growing in two directions. You're getting bigger. You're adding more servers, more uh, load, uh, more users, stuff like that. Um, but you're also getting more complicated. Uh, you're adding more different services. And the interactions between all of those uh, grow at a phenomenal rate. Uh, and at some point, the graph gets really hard to keep track of. And at one point, uh, service A on machine one fails to communicate with service Q on machine 17 2% of the time. And all you know is that your users are getting random intermittent timeout errors, and you have no idea what's going on. So. Uh, uh, I like to think about this as in terms of the, the cat's cradle principle. The, the number of hands uh, covered in string that you would require to model your architecture if you were playing some kind of weirdo CS cat's cradle is directly proportional to the number of hairs that you'll tear out when something goes wrong. So things get really messy. Um, the more moving parts you have, the more weird ways there are to fail. Uh, you have to worry about network, lat like, uh, network latency, throughput, um, problems with uh, the hardware and infrastructure themselves, um, partial failures, uh, unresponsive apps. Um, while you're at it, you might as well worry about zombies, snakes, angry elephants, uh, swarms of bees, and telemarketers. Uh, so uh, microservices are easier to understand individually, but they uh, interact in much more complex ways. Um, and so developers really need to pay more attention to how they plan to, to deal with these things. Uh, thinking about how you're going to deal with failure needs to be a, a first class component of how you design your, your project. So the idea that uh, I'd like to, that I've, um, come up with over the, the past uh, few months. Uh, you should fail well, fail well, log much, and check often. Uh, so you should approach a project um, knowing uh, in advance how you want to uh, handle failures. Uh, you should try and do that gracefully and expressively so that when something goes wrong, uh, not only are you not leaving the uh, uh, server and the whole rest of your project in like a really shitty state. Um, you also like are communicating the the uh, status of your system uh, in a way that makes it easier for anybody who's using your project or uh, even yourself later when you're fixing it. 
You should anticipate that uh, other parts of the system that you don't have control over will fail. And you should um, pay attention to how your, how your work uh, will behave in situations like that. Um, you should think about how to expose the status of your service, um, making sure that you don't get a situation where it looks like everything is working fine and, and everything is not working fine and there's something on fire in the server room and uh, it's a real mess. <clears throat> and uh, that way you can spend less time dodging blame and more time enjoying this beautiful summer weather. So uh, uh, the mo uh, monitoring and alerting, the, uh, that's kind of out of scope for this talk. Um, but if you're interested in it, you should look into Elastalert, which works really well with the rest of the talk. It's a newly open source project by Yelp. But logging. Um, so first idea, dog food, write logs that you would want to debug from. Uh, your logs should be able to uh, give the, the reader an understanding of like where you are in the code, what the heck you're doing, uh, what you thought would happen, and what actually did happen. And you can save yourself a lot of forensic investigation uh, later on. Uh, you can use uh, logging libraries that handle all the, the grunt work of um, uh, trying to figure out how to like pass the messages around in your code, um, how to make sure that things are being logged at the right level and, and everything like that. Um, and uh, I think that logging, like working with uh, logging and errors is actually a really, really great way to get involved with an open source project. In order, if there's a project that you use um, that fails in a way that makes it really, really hard to uh, get it back working again, uh, this is a really great way to introduce yourself to the code. You can move through all of it, write better error messages. Um, yeah, there's a, a really low barrier to entry to getting involved in a, in a project like that, and you're helping yourself out later. Uh, so for example, uh, the logging library in Python is conveniently enough named logging. Um, one uh, good practice when you're using something like this, uh, you should use the, the module name uh, to identify the logger that you are using in your code, and that makes it easier to pinpoint errors. Um, if, there, if an error does occur, you can get the uh, exception information with uh, this X info. Um, so something like this happens, it's raining men instead of raining cats and dogs, uh, it, that will pass its way up the stack and hopefully get to the end user who can use that to figure out what's actually going on. Um, so as of Python 3.2, uh, you can also get a stack trace using a, a similar method, which is, uh, okay. Uh, so again, that is really helpful uh, in order to figure out where you are and what's going on. Uh, and um, another good practice when you're logging in Python, um, so uh, you should add a null handler, uh, which kind of handles the case where the logs that you are creating, they, uh, so, so in, in the, the way that the, the Python logging client um, handles errors is it basically passes things up the stack until it finds a handler that is set to uh, take, what it's, uh, take what you gave it and put it somewhere useful for somebody or deal with it in some other way. Um, so if no handler in any layer of the code is specified, the null handler will take care of it. Um, basically, if you don't specify a handler, uh, any null handlers at all, um, you get a warning, which it's not a big deal, but it's a, uh, a nice thing to do to avoid confusing your users with that. Um, but it, it, another important thing to note is that uh, in general, if you're writing a library or code that other people will use in their own projects, you don't want to handle errors for them. Um, basically, uh, you should uh, let the let the information like pass all the way up to the final application and end user, uh, and they can choose how they want to handle and deal with it. 
that avoids a lot of confusion where you're uh, missing logs as, as the user and uh, because they're being handled in some place lower down the line. So just pass it on up, basically. So uh, now that you have all of these beautiful, well-written, expressive logs, uh, what do you do with them? Introducing the majestic ELK. Uh, so ELK stands for Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. And ELK is just like a better acronym than LEC, I guess. Um, so Logstash, uh, the big idea there is that you can use that to uh, transport and centralize your logs. So Logstash, uh, it's basically a uh, a big uh, like transit depot for the logs. So there are a lot of inputs, there are a lot of outputs, and there are a lot of ways that you can transform the, the logs while you have them there. Um, so there are input plugins like syslog, TCP, UDP, more exotic ones, GitHub, uh, basically anywhere that you might expect you, there, there is information that you want to get out. Uh, Logstash probably has a, an input plugin for it. And over 50 output plugins as well. You can send these all over. You can get an email when somebody uh, uh, screws up and the, the log reads something that you uh, didn't intend for it to. Um, so there are, yeah, there are, uh, it, it's able to direct the logs uh, in a really, really flexible fashion, which is useful. Um, and also, it can parse and transform log data uh, while it has it in its clutches. So basically, it can take advantage of whatever structure there is in the, the logs that you've defined and um, take that and transform it into JSON or something that uh, you can use and, and index and search more easily. So instead of just like staring at uh, strings with, with uh, meanings that you can't quite remember if this is the uh, client IP address or the server IP address. Um, it'll, uh, it can tag them uh, and uh, transform them in such a way so that it exposes the structure. Um, so you can add tags. You can do multi-line matching. So if you have a big stack trace or exception trace, it, it will process all of that as one event. Um, you can keep track of metrics. You can even do things like anonymize data so that if you're working with sensitive data uh, and you're trying to send it somewhere else to be processed or to be visible, you can purge anything that you wouldn't want uh, passed on to a less secure server in that case. Um, and there are community provided patterns to match a lot of log types. And basically, uh, that makes it a lot more convenient. You, do, you don't have to roll your own your configuration with a lot of this. You can just pick and choose something that, that other people have worked on. And it makes it uh, pretty simple to, to set up for your specific situation. Um, so Elasticsearch, the big idea is make the logs that you just uh, centralized, make them really easy to search. Uh, Elasticsearch, it stores and indexes your document. And it exposes them through a REST API. Um, it's super fast, and it scales beautifully. Uh, even uh, under really high throughput, it'll be it, you can set it up uh, so that the documents are accessible in like very near real time. Um, it, it has a really powerful and full-featured querying language. It's based on Apache Lucene, so um, the, the all, almost all of the features in the Lucene API are available in Elasticsearch, which is really convenient. Um, and you can do interesting things with that. And uh, so Kibana's job is to visualize trends and uh, make it easy to see when things are working and when things aren't working or behaving as expected. Uh, Kibana is really, really uh, great at making visualization and analytics uh, really accessible for people who don't want to spend a lot of time um, like munching through code and like fixing graphs. Um, 
it provides a, an, an interface that's uh, uh, basically anybody can figure out and, and use really, really quickly. Um, it, it makes it, especially in Kibana 4, uh, it is really painless to share the things that you find. You can embed queries and, and graphs um, and whatever in, in other documents as long as the server that you're hosting Kibana on is accessible. Um, so you can uh, share the things that you can, you can share, uh, for example, like if you're doing a postmortem on a bug that you found, uh, you can share the, the query that identified the root cause and kind of sh pass that information along and, and save it for uh, posterity. Um, and Kibana makes it really easy to browse, search, aggregate, and graph like anything that's going on in your data. There are a ton of different graph types. There's pie charts. Uh, you can uh, use, uh, yeah, you can aggregate your data in, in useful ways. Um, it, it makes it really, really easy to uh, see what's going on, basically. Uh, so how it all fits together quickly. Uh, if this is your setup, you've got some client machine and one centralized uh, logging server or a cluster of centralized logging servers. Um, basically, you, you set up the client to ship the logs into, Elast into um, Logstash, and it uh, just propagates through there. Um, we have a lot of options for when it comes to uh, shipping the logs from the client side. Um, Probably the easiest ones to get started with, if you're interested in playing around, um, are uh, Logstash Forwarder, which was formerly called Lumberjack, and it's now a, an official part of the Logstash project. Um, or there's an rsyslog input, which makes it super easy as well. And that was the last wall text for a while, <laughs> promise. <laughs> so this is um, the Kibana interface. Hey, no. There we go. Okay, so so um, Kibana uh, gives you the ability to to search and, and poke around in the logs in, in any interesting way. Uh, I don't know if you caught that, but you can drag a, like a drag over a, a sequence of um, uh, so you can drag over like a, a sequence of um, logs in, in a histogram or something and expand and look only at that subset uh, of the things that you uh, selected. This is uh, kind of what the, the logs look like. Um, in this uh, uh, um, discover tab up at the top. Um, it breaks the logs down into pieces, shows you the raw data, and also uh, the indexed bits of the log. And uh, so you can see all of the different um, pieces of the log that you might be interested in looking at are available there. Uh, these fields get populated in log stash when you are, are parsing out the log. And if you're interested in what the raw JSON looks like, it's like that. Um, so now this is going to go through um, the process of creating a, a visualization using these logs. So we're going to make a line chart. Um, and so you, you base this uh, on an Elasticsearch query that, that gets, fetches the data for you and that Kibana renders. Um, so uh, in this case, a, a date histogram uh, in the x-axis means that you're plotting everything versus time, um, bucketed uh, time. And uh, in this case, we are going to be uh, searching, uh, aggregating by a term, which is basically like a SQL group by. Um, so anything with that value for that uh, uh, index is, is going to be grouped together. And so what this, uh, what this total query provides us is um, a count of the number, the total number of uh, log hits uh, that we encountered for um, 
all users grouped by country, which you will see in a second here. There you go. So it's a little bit messy. Um, but you can see mousing over each of the individual data points. You can get more information about the, the exact counts uh, and whatnot. And we can also clean this up so there are slightly fewer uh, confusing uh, lines there. And it's a little bit easier to read. Okay. And so, yeah, basically uh, save that query um, and create more visualizations that, that kind of showcase the other things that Kibana can do. Um, so let's create another line graph here. Um, but it, instead, we can demonstrate the filtering capabilities. So you can uh, use the uh, use the sub abrogation sub uh, aggregation of uh, a filter to uh, look only at a subset of logs that meet whatever condition you specify. Um, and again, this is based on the uh, Elasticsearch query language, which means that you can specify a lot of different things. Um, in this case, we're going to look at logs where uh, the username matches uh, a specific cert, like a first initial um, and compare those. And that graphs a cute little series of peaks for us. And again, mousing over gives you a lot more information about what exactly is, is going on in the chart. So we'll save that um, and uh, add that to our list of visualizations that we can use later uh, in the Kibana, in the, the dashboard that we will create. So uh, this is going to demonstrate the process of creating the dashboard. Basically, what you do is you just take all of the different queries and, and visualizations that you've made and um, drag and drop them anywhere you want, resize them. Um, you can get more uh, metadata about the uh, issues that are going on um, or what exactly the, the queries are returning um, by looking through here. And here's the uh, hits by country graph that we just created. And you can see how easy it is to resize it um, and show more information about what's going on and check out why this big crazy spike is there. <coughs> uh, so uh, a couple other graphs and types that are available. Uh, there is a, a stacked area graph. And I couldn't come up with anything that looked even remotely interesting as a stacked area graph in the, the fake logs that I was using for this demonstration. So it's, it's there. It's kind of pretty colored. Uh, and you can also embed just, just charts of data um, if, that's, if that makes it convenient for you to uh, uh, understand what's going on uh, or to get the kind of uh, visibility that you need into the system. And uh, yeah, you can you can see more information about uh, the the data that's being presented here, um, including the basically the queries that, that we're using against Elasticsearch and the raw responses that we're getting. Um, in case you need that for other debugging purposes. And um, there's uh, let's see. 
uh, one more uh, graph type. There, there, are, there are other, are other graph types. Uh, but there's one more that I, I wanted to demonstrate. Uh, it's a stacked pie chart. Um, so you can uh, create a, a pie chart that divides things up um, in, uh, against two queries, basically. Um, so you can see the, the first one and the second one. This is uh, basically the result of like uh, searching for which, what graduate deg degrees people in each country had. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and so uh, doing that gives you a little bit more insight into how things are uh, set up. Uh, uh, in, in, in an extra dimension that would be hard to, to see otherwise. <clears throat> and so troubleshooting through, with, uh, with logs is all well and good, but it, we live in people space uh, and work towards uh, uh, your technical problems happens in people space as well. Uh, so I, I really believe that culture is part of your toolkit uh, as a software team. Um, information is distributed across users, developers, teams, and, and entire organizations. Um, and so getting that information, making that accessible uh, easily and um, in a timely manner is, is really important uh, for fixing problems. Um, so Logstash has no input module for the human brain yet. So uh, unfortunately or, or fortunately, that means you probably have to actually talk to people. Um, one thing that you can do uh, is, um, one thing that you can do as an organization is to uh, clearly define points of contact for each uh, part of your, each part of the project that you're working on. Uh, if you have one person who uh, is really uh, involved with setting up the deployment mechanism, uh, you know, mention that on your wiki page. Um, somebody else who's, who's uh, great at the UI. Um, make sure that there's like a, a defined person uh, that you can go to when something goes wrong in any of these spaces. Um, and that makes that a lot less stressful for people who are encountering bugs. And of course, mutual respect and trust within teams uh, makes it not only a lot less painful to uh, um, deal, with, deal with these problems as they crop up, um, but it also makes it uh, more successful and occasionally kind of fun to try and figure out exactly what's going on. Um, so in conclusion, uh, you should design your products to fail gracefully and expressively. Um, you can use the Elk stack to centralize, analyze, and visualize your logs. Um, and then because this is all working so successfully, you can, have a, you can kick back and have a beer with your coworkers instead of banging your head against your monitor.